Right, to the main events. Lisa Schneider is a Devon-based storyteller, and we're also very proud to say that she's part of the Devon Wildlife Trust team, and she heads up the Nature Improvement Area project in North Devon. Lisa tells nature stories across the Southwest and has authored two wonderful books, and I can personally vouch for them, um, Botanical Folk Tales and Woodland Folk Tales. So are you all sitting comfortably? Brilliant. Lisa, would you like to begin? Thank you very much, Emmy. Good evening, everyone. I'm, um, I'm talking to you from uh, Chagford in northeast Dartmoor. And I've been working on my other job, my Devon Wildlife Trust job all day. So it is lovely to change hats and to put on my storytelling hat and to bring you some stories. Well, some stories from the Southwest, some stories from Devon. They are traditional stories. These are not my stories. They are stories that have often been found by folklorists or have been passed down from person to person to person for a long time. And usually it's the best stories that remain and the best stories that carry on. And they are all stories about the land and about nature and about this time of year. So you may recognize some places in them, you may recognize some people, um, but I hope you find something in them to inspire you that you will enjoy. Quite a lot of folk tales from the Southwest and indeed across Britain are about farming because in the old days, most people lived on the land. Most people lived in the countryside before the big cities ever happened. And this first story I have for you is one of those tales. It is about a farmer and that farmer had two sons. Now those two sons were very, very different characters. The eldest son was one of those dreamers who seemed to prefer being outdoors and being outside in nature to sometimes even being in the company of people. He loved nothing better than being outside watching nature, whether it was watching the birds, whether it was watching the insects in the grass, whether it was peeling the bark back off a log to see what creatures were underneath it. He was always out there exploring. And as he grew up, it became very obvious that he didn't really care about getting a proper job or getting money or anything to do with making his way in the outer world. He was quite happy just being outside. But his younger brother, now he was a different piece of work. The younger brother was the kind of character who was always looking for the main chance, always looking for the best advantage for himself in any situation always thinking about what was in it for him and where the money was. Now you can imagine, these two brothers didn't really get on too well. Well, eventually, one day in high springtime, the old farmer died. And it was the custom in the Southwest in the old days for all of the inheritance not to go to the eldest in the family, but to go to the youngest because the eldest in the family were expected to have made their way in life already. And so it was the younger brother who got the big house and got the farm and got the land and got the animals and got everything. Well, he now had all the power he wanted. And he set about giving generous gifts to different members of the far reaching family across Devon. But to his elder brother, well, that was different. He loved making his elder brother feel as awkward and small and unimportant as possible. He called his brother to him and he said, now, this, uh, this house that you've been living in, this, uh, this house that's now my house, I think you should move. You know, I think you really should find a place of your own. It's about time, you know, uh, you, you probably should have done it long ago, let's face it. And uh, seeing as I've come into all of this land and this farm, I'm going to make a suggestion of where you could live. You know, that old cottage, the one that our father grew up in with his father before, the one on that little bit of land, it's, I think there's still a cattle shed there. I think there's maybe even a couple of old animals in there. I think you should go to live there. 
In fact, I'm telling you to go to live there. I'm not giving it to you, mind. I will expect rent. I'll expect rent on the dot, first of the month, every month. Otherwise, I'm sure I can find a better tenant. Now, uh, I think you should go and clear your things. Charming. Well, the elder brother took a few possessions of his from the big house and he made his way down the track to where that tumble down cottage was still there. You know, the stone walls were strong, but the roof was half caved in and the old stable next to it. Well, that was in an even sorrier state. And looking over the door of that old stable were two animals. There was an old donkey that was so thin you could have played tunes on its ribs. And there was an old ox, and the old ox was definitely on its last legs. It was covered in sores. It had been really badly looked after. And there wasn't much else. The bit of ground was sparse and stony, and there were just the odd apple tree where the old ones had still survived, fallen over and old. No apples on those. But the older brother, he didn't complain. He just rolled his sleeves up and he got on with it. And because it was high spring, he went out into the little Devon lanes just by the farm and he collected all kinds of herbs. He collected sticky weed. He collected tall grasses. He collected all manner of things that were good for animals to eat. And he came back with armfuls of greenery and he fed the ox and the donkey with all kinds of herbs, all kinds of leaves from the, from the newly sprouted trees. Well, the donkey and the ox hadn't eaten so well in years. And then he went back up the lane. He found other herbs, he found comfrey, he found nettle, and he bashed them all together. And he made a poultice and he put that on the sores on the skin of the old ox. And you know, the donkey and the ox started to fatten out nicely. And the ox, well, stood up and walked smart. And they were turned out into the old orchard. And of course, because this is a farming story, all the goodness that those animals had eaten came out the other end. And that made the land flourish a treat. And those apple trees, well, even they started to perk up a bit. And later that year, the older brother realized that the apple trees had so much mistletoe on them that they were groaning with it. And he cut that mistletoe and he sold it at market and he made a good amount of money, enough to see him through that first winter, enough to pay his rent to his brother, who never bothered visiting and didn't even bother coming out to see him when he went to pay his rent. But the older brother carried on. He got an old part-time job at the farm up the road. But the problem was, when it got to the second year, it was one of those years that the Southwest does really, really well. It rained. And it rained. And it didn't just rain, it pelted, it carried on raining, it soaked everything. It seemed as if it would never stop raining. And while in the springtime, you can still look out for the signs of spring and the little bits of hope and the summer came round and still there was mud and the land was waterlogged and the rain carried on all year long. Well, there was not much work to be had. The elder brother was really struggling to find money by now. There wasn't much off the land at all. But by the time he got to the autumn, by the time the night started to draw in, everything became dark again. Even the elder brother got a little bit low. He found himself sitting in that cottage with the, the rain still coming through the roof, thinking to himself, well, this is pretty picture, isn't it? Not much going for me, not much in terms of prospects, not much in terms of help, and he hasn't even bothered to come and see me. And it got to Christmas Eve. And Christmas Eve was yet another dark, rainy, cold day. And just before dusk, there was a knock at the door, and in strode the younger brother. 
all smiles, all happy, and he had a good hint of brandy on his breath. I've got a proposal for you, he said. I've been down the pub, and they've told me some things about my land, my farm, my place. They've told me that somewhere on this land, there is treasure buried. Now, nobody knows where it is. Everyone's looked for it, no one has ever found it. But they also told me down the pub that tonight, when the clock strikes 12 midnight for Christmas day, then for an hour, they say, the animals can talk. I need to find the oldest animal on the farm, the, the animal that would tell me where the treasure is. And I reckon that old donkey of yours, I reckon he's the one to tell me. So here's my plan. Just before midnight, you come up to the big house and you bang on the door and you wake me up. Wake me up so that I can come down here and I can have a chat with that donkey of yours and I can find out where my treasure is. And if you do it, if you come and wake me up, then you know I might take sixpence off your rent for January, if you're lucky. But if you don't, if you don't bother coming up to the house and waking me up, then I'm sure I can find another tenant here after Christmas. You know, it's not as if you're looking after the place, is it? And without another word, the youngest brother turned on his well-leathered heel and left. Well, this year was getting better and better, wasn't it? The light was going down, it was definitely past Dimpsey time now, and the elder brother sat there and thought, charming. Well, I've got to do something to cheer myself up. He went to the kitchen cupboard, and in the kitchen cupboard was an old, dry crust of bread and the last of the year's cider. And he took the cider and he, he poured it into a tin mug and he found the odd bit of old spices in the cupboard. And he took it to the kitchen fire in the grate and he mulled the cider over the fire. And then with that mug of cider and with the dry crust of bread in his pocket and his collar turned up, he decided to go outside. He could hardly find the ground solid under his feet underneath all the mud and the rain was running in torrents down the hill towards his land. And he walked out and squelched out and slid all the way out to where those ancient apple trees were standing still on the ground. Well, they'd been pruned a little, but they were still twisted, fallen over. He went to the tree that looked like the oldest of all. And all the time, rain, pelting down on him, trickling into his hair, down the back of his head, down the back of his neck, down the back of his shirt. And he came to a squelching stop in front of the tree. And then he dunked the bread in the mug of cider. He wedged that bread just in the crook of branches of that apple tree. He poured a little bit of the cider on the roots of the tree and then he drank a little bit of it for himself and he stood back and he started to sing. Old apple tree, I wassail thee and hoping thou shall bear for the lady knows where we shall be when apples come next year. And you might know what he said next. Hats full, caps full, three bushel bags full, and a girt heap under the stairs, hooray! That last little cheer was so small in the night air and the pelting rain, and the sound dulled away, and then it just carried on raining. What do I do now, he thought. The cider was making a nice little warm trail down inside him to his belly and he found himself looking at the old apple tree. Just in the last of the evening's light, he could see the fissures and the, the lines and the cracks in the trunk of the tree. He thought to himself, well, how old are you, apple 
poetry. What have you seen in your lifetime? And as he watched the trunk of the tree, he, he could swear the bark moved. And he watched some more and it definitely was moving. Somehow the bark of the tree was twisting itself and moving and turning and making a big barky grin. And it was twisting and turning into two little dark pippy eyes. And the mouth opened and the apple tree spoke. It really did, it spoke. That were a drop of good. The tree just spoke. That were a drop of good. Now come on, hurry up. Hurry up. Hurry up. Treasure, treasure. The tree started to wave a branch out towards where one of its roots was sticking up above the ground, out towards the corner of the orchard. There, treasure. That's yours. Go on. What was there to lose? The elder brother went to get a spade and he dug where the tree had waved his branches. And it wasn't long before the spade that went into the mud and into the soaked soil hit metal. And a lot of mud later, the elder brother found a big tin box there in the ground and he opened the lid and there was the glint of gold coins. That's yours, said the tree. Go on, hide it. Well, thank you. But the apple tree said nothing more. Elder brother didn't have much time to lose. He took that gold back to the little cottage. He hid it in a sack under the bed. And he did have to hurry, for it was close to midnight. And he squelched his way now up the track, up the track, right up through the farm, up to the big house where there were lights and wreaths and Christmas decorations and all manner of greenery on the big house. And he took the great brass door knocker on the door and he walloped it against the door. Wake up! Well, it took a little while for the younger brother to emerge, yawning, stretching his posh pyjamas and his quilted smoking jacket. And he pulled on his posh wellies and several layers of waterproofs. Come on! And just as the younger brother stepped out of the door, the elder brother was away, running as fast as he could down the track, back down to his little rundown cottage. Under the bed, he pulled out the sack of gold. He slung it over his shoulders. He made sure the old ox and the donkey got a little bit of extra food. And then the elder brother, with all of his treasure, he was away. He was out of the farm, walking up the road towards the village and way beyond, and right out of this story. But what about the younger brother? Well, he just about made his way along the track and squelched his way through the mud until he got to where that old cottage was still run down and dripping and next to it the run down old stable. And poking their heads over the gates of that stable looking for all intents and purposes like some nativity scene, there was the old ox and the old donkey. And just as the younger brother made it down to where they were, the clock in the church and the village began to strike. One, two, three, four. The younger brother was looking at the ox and the donkey. The ox and the donkey. Weren't really that bothered. Five, six, Seven, eight, the rain was trickling down the younger brother's neck already. Oh, it was horrible out here. Nine, 10, 11, 12. It was Christmas day. Well, come on then, talk. Tell me where the treasure is, come on. 
You have to hand it to that ox and that donkey. They gave each other the odd look, but they made the younger brother wait for a full 55 minutes. Before the donkey turned to the ox and he said, Here. Yeah. What? Here, this, this fool, this young fool. Listen. Yeah. He wants to know where the treasure is. Yeah. Well, he ain't going to get it, is he? Someone already took it. And that, well, the story doesn't say what happened to the younger brother next. But I'm sure you can imagine. So, we are going to move from where I always set that story in North Devon, not because it rains all the time, honest. We're going to move down to the south of Dartmoor now and to a story that comes actually from a Devon Wildlife Trust nature reserve. If you know anything of the land around Bovey Tracy, um, which is to the kind of southeast of Dartmoor, you will know that there is some glorious lowland heathland around that place and we have got a nature reserve there, Bovey Heathfield. And if you've not been there, do go there. It is quite wonderful. And this story comes from the heath around Bovey Tracy. So whenever I go to that reserve, this is what I imagine happening. It concerns an old woman. And for some reason, this old woman woke up wide awake, bolt upright in the middle of the night, one night. It was a long night. It was quite a wintry night. And for some reason, when she woke up, she was convinced that it was already morning. Have you ever done that? Where your inner clock has been completely out of kilter and you're sure it's morning. Well, that's what happened to her. And she was so convinced it was morning that, well, she got up, she put on her dress, she went downstairs, she made herself a cup of tea, she prepared for her day. Whether it was because the moon was bright in the sky and she thought it was the sun, I really don't know, and neither did she. But after she had started her morning, she decided that she needed to ride over the heath to the market at Bovey. And so she put on her bonnet and tied the ribbons under her chin and she put on her great coat and she got out, she got to her little pony, saddled up the pony and she was off over the heath in the middle of the night, quite contented. And she was really quite enjoying the journey when she suddenly noticed something up ahead. She could see in the moonlight something up ahead traveling towards her at speed. Now, it first of all just looked like a blur of a shape and then when the moon hit this thing heading towards her, she could make out two ears, flat, terrified. And it wasn't long after that that the shape reached her. The shape was a large brown hare and its eyes were terrified. And for some reason, just as it reached her, the old woman on the little pony, well, the hare stopped on a tussock of heather and it looked up to her and it was pleading, so scared. The old woman was a practical old woman and so she said, right, my lovely, you're coming with me. And she picked that hair up by its two long ears, opened up one of the panniers on her little pony, popped it inside, shut the lid, and that was that. Not a moment too soon, because now heading towards the old woman was quite a different character. She heard the sound of hooves, the baying of hounds, and galloping towards her was a dark, horse and on that dark horse the silhouette 
of a rider, a rider with a hood over his head. And as that rider came closer and reared up his horse and then started to walk around her in intimidating fashion on that great black horse, she could see the character didn't really have eyes to speak of under that hood. There was just a gaping black hole, but there, just by the hood, she could see two little buds of horns coming out of the forehead of the creature. And then there were the hounds. The hounds had red eyes. The hounds were baying and their breath smelled of sulfur and the old woman knew exactly who this was. If you never know anything about Dartmoor, you will also know. This was the devil himself. And on Dartmoor, we call Dewar. Dewar, who wanders the moor with his wished hounds, looking for trouble, sniffing out problems and making chaos. And sure enough, the old woman looked down to where that figure's feet should have been in the stirrups of the horse and yet, uh, on the horse and yet, there were no feet. There were cloven hooves. And the old woman was a practical woman. And she just sat still on her pony and the dewer came up, put his face very close to hers, breathed sulphur into her face, which she did not appreciate, and said, Madam, have you seen our quarry? We are chasing a hare. It is most important that we catch it. Have you seen it? Think carefully before you answer. Well, this old woman was not the kind of old woman to be told what to do by anybody. And she knew a thing or two about Dewar. And she held his gaze, even though she couldn't see through the dark evil underneath that hooded cloak that he was wearing. She said steadily, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Are you sure, said Dewar? Are you very sure? Are you doubting my words, said the old woman? Go on with you, go on. Well, the hounds shouted and bayed and Dewar was not happy, but all he could do was leave. And he rode past her in a huff and the hounds followed close by and the smell of sulphur eventually evaporated into the night air. Well, said the old woman, not very good types around these parts these days, are there? She carried on riding. A little shaky on the pony, the pony was steady. But it wasn't long after that that she suddenly remembered the hare. The hare was no longer in the pannier bag. She looked inside, but there in front of her instead, there was a woman in white. That woman in white smiled. Who are you? I was the hare, said the woman. I'd like to thank you. I was cursed. I was cursed for a bad deed over 10 years ago. And since that time, I have been chased across the moor in the form of a hare. And I have been chased by Dewar for 10 years. And then my only hope was for somebody else to get in between me and them and you did it. And I would like to reward you. I will reward you in many ways. You will find plenty in your life, said the woman in white. But you will find also that you are never again bettered in an argument. Your opinion will always be right. Oh, that's quite good, said the old woman. Thank you. And it turned out to be true. The woman in, wh in white was right. From that day onwards, that old woman's cows gave twice the amount of milk they used to. The hens laid twice as many eggs. 
and her husband could never win an argument again. But there was one other thing that uh, that woman in white told the old lady. Dewar can take many forms, she said. You must look out for him because he can be man or woman or beast you will not know. The only things Dewar cannot change himself into are the form of a dove and the form of a lamb. But he does have quite a fancy for politics, she said. Make sure you look out for him there. So, Emmy, I have one more very, very short story. Will you, uh, will you allow me? I don't think I could say no, to be honest. It's really short. <laughs> <laughs> So my last little story, um, one of the books Emmy mentioned earlier, which is um, this book, Woodland Folk Tales, that has recently come out. Um, a little delayed with lockdown, but I did a lot of research on this book in the last couple of years. And this little story is a story from Somerset that um, I found last year, way before coronavirus. It's very strange how these stories work. It's from the east of the Mendip Hills, and it concerns a woodland. And this woodland was full of deer, but everyone around those parts knew, and the woodman working in the wood particularly knew, that running with all of the deer there, the red deer, the roe deer, there was a white heart, a bright white deer, an albino deer, a special deer. And everybody also knew that if you were lucky enough to see this white deer, then good luck would follow you for weeks. It was a good omen, it was a good sign, and of course everybody looked for it. And if you have ever been out there looking for wildlife, you will know that if you look for it, you never see it. But it's when you're not looking that it happens. And so it was in this story. And this story happened around about this time of year. It was at dusk and the light was going down and the sky was red. And it was beautiful in that woodland. Even though most things had rotted, even though the leaves had nearly come off the trees, it was a wonderful evening to ride through the woods. And a great lord of that place, a local lord, was riding through the woods on his fine horse. But he wasn't enjoying the evening. He wasn't enjoying the beginnings of the sparkle of the frost to come on the branches. He wasn't enjoying the smell of the leaves rotting on the forest floor. He was very, very preoccupied. Because this Lord looked after a whole society, a whole community of people that lived on his land and worked his land. And there was a great plague among those people. There was a terrible disease that had gone through the people in that community like wildfire. It had caused death, it had caused heartache, it had caused pain. And he felt helpless to do anything about it. He wanted to help them, but it seemed no matter what he did to try to help, the disease just took more and more people and sapped the energy of people. And it seemed like hope was leaving them. And so he was riding pretty gloomily through the woods until out of the corner of his eye, there was a flash of white. He wasn't looking for it, but it, as if it was in a dream, there in front of his horse, a white stag came out of the woods, bounded down to the track that he was riding along and stopped and turned and looked at him. It must have just been a few seconds, but it seemed like much longer. And then the heart was away, bounding through the woods and the Lord gave chase, the Lord steeled his horse and he followed. He followed through the trees off the track. He must have followed that deer for a good couple of miles before, of course, it got the better of him and it disappeared through the trees. They say that it was the sighting of the White Heart that turned the plague around in that place. It's a strange thing to say, but something about seeing that creature seeded a tiny little spark of hope inside that Lord. He started to look at the world a little differently. 
his wonder was renewed. And he went back to the community that lived on his land and he started to think about different ways they could survive, different ways they could pull through, different ways they could work together to strengthen the community there. And that strength in him soon became infectious in turn. The hope, the positivity, the little spark that had started with the white, white um, stag soon went through the people and they themselves started to feel a little stronger. It was all because of that white heart that that particular community pulled through and saw the springtime and saw the sparks of the new light to come. So, I will leave you with that little story of hope. I wish you all a very merry midwinter. I hope you've enjoyed the tales and it would be lovely to have a chat about any questions you might have. Lisa, thank you so much. I, I can't speak for everyone on this, um, on this event, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Thank you for sharing those. And um, I love the fact that you finished with the white heart as well. I think at the moment we could all take heart from that. And uh, it shows that hope does reign eternal, doesn't it? And it can often be found in nature. So we've had a few questions through and um, it would be, be good to get through as many as we can. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of questions, We've had a couple of shorter ones. So do albino deers really exist? That's the first one for you, Lisa. <laughs> yes, they do. Yes, yes they, they do. do. Um, okay. In fact, um, I have worked on advisory teams. I'm choosing my words carefully. I've worked on advisory teams in Devon where advisors have come back in the office and said, I've seen a white deer. Oh, um, it's, it's a kind of, uh, I think it's a mutation where there's no pigment in the skin um, okay. from the scientific point of view. But if you are ever lucky enough to see a white deer, a white heart or a white hind, don't tell anyone because there are trophy hunters out there who would love to know exactly where those creatures are. So it's something to look out for, but it's something also to keep secret. Some secret luck if you find it. Definitely. Well, I was going to ask you if you've ever seen one, but I wouldn't dare now. <laughs> I haven't actually, I would love to. Um, okay. But yes, it's one of those things to, to look out for. Brilliant, thank you for that. And um, another question from one of our one of our um, members of the audience. Is Dua really the name of the devil on Dartmoor? Absolutely, yes. There are many, many Dua stories. Um, one of the most famous ones is from Widdicombe in the Moor, um, where if you go into the church in Widdicombe, you will find the story of um, a, a thunderstorm where the, um, the spire of the church was hit, there was a thunderball that went down the aisle, there were many people killed, it was 1600 and, was it 1638, something like that. So it was, was actually um, a happening, it did really happen. Mm -hmm. um, but the folk tale is all about Dewar riding into Whittacombe. He, he actually um, goes into the pub on the way and he, he orders some beer and the beer hisses as it goes down his gullet and everyone's thinking, this isn't a normal man. And he, he puts the tankard down on, on the bar in the, in the pub and it leaves a kind of charred ring on the bar. But he was on his way to find um, a ne'er-do-well in Whittacombe called Jan Reynolds who um, was a gambler and um, had done a deal with the devil that uh, the devil wouldn't take his soul as long as he didn't fall asleep in church. And on that day, of course, he fell asleep in church and the devil came to get him in the form of a fireball. And they say Jan Reynolds was taken up into the sky um, before he was taken down to hell and he dropped his playing cards. And you will find those playing cards um, in certain parts of the moor where there are ancient enclosures on the moor up near the Warren House Inn. They are Jan Reynolds playing cards. Oh. There's a whole legend around it, but it actually happened too. It's quite interesting. So yeah, Dewar, some of the stories are really sick. I wouldn't recommend um, encountering them if you're feeling a bit low or um, are easily scared. Um, some of the others are, are quite fun. Um, there are some people who think it was a Victorian invention. There are other people who think Dewar is a lot older. Um, but yeah, Dew was definitely there. Maybe one for All Hallows Eve. Mm, absolutely, yes. Mm, okay, <laughs> brilliant. So um, we've had a couple of questions as well around your storytelling itself. So um, if you could talk a little bit about where you get your inspiration from, and um, I'm bundling a few questions together. So where you get your inspiration from, um, is it always nature or is there a range of things which inspire your stories? 
And um, and do you do you take inspiration from other storytellers? Do you evolve what they say? Yeah. Um... So first of all, inspirational storytelling. I first started storytelling probably about 15 years ago and um, I came across a couple of storytellers and um, storytelling is a really wonderful art form because you are sharing stories, but there is an element of heritage there because these stories have been passed on. They are shared um, and there's evidence that has been done on the language of some stories such as Jack and the Beanstalk um, it's meant to be about 5,000 years old. Imagine how many times that's been told from person to person. So this notion of being able to share old stories, uh, which have got resonance with community and land and place, um, and they themselves having some old magic in them that we don't quite understand, it was just irresistible for me. And I went into storytelling wanting to um, work with environmental story and wanting to... Um, be of service to the land through story really and found very quickly that stories are not usually about just the environment of course because they're about humans because we're humans right it's all about what happens to human beings and the environment that it happens within but I am always more drawn to those stories which are about the land and they're often quite little um, some of the big myths and the mythological cycles like the Arthurian stories or the, the Norse myths, they're big and grand and full of weird gods, but these little stories of the land um, keep pulling me back. Um, going on to stories and inspiration from other tellers, yes. Um, <laughs> there's a little, um, little saying in storytelling um, that I think Ben Haggerty said at one point, um, all storytelling is theft, but there is honor among thieves. <laughs> and what he meant was that, of course, you know, stories have to be found somewhere. And um, the folklorists like um, Baring Gould, in fact, who went out and, and found many folk songs and stories across Dartmoor, he was himself listening to people telling stories who'd heard them from someone who'd heard them from someone and so on. But the key thing about stories is getting, as a teller, is getting to understand those stories and work them and live them to a certain extent before you tell them. So you're not kind of repeating them uh, verbatim um, and neither are you using someone's interpretation, you're working those stories yourself. So uh, the vast majority of the stories that are in uh, the two books are stories I've worked. And there's some really interesting things behind that where things have gone into the story that have just happened and other bits stripped out. And that's how stories live and change. Um, it's a really interesting dynamic, but that in itself is is endlessly inspiring as well, I think. I mean, there's something really lovely about the fact that a story is organic and it takes organic natural forms to sort of weave into it as well. So they kind of grow together. Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, I have a little bee in my bonnet because I, I would about um, nature in story and about representing the non-human as much as the human. Um, so you're not just walking into the woods, you're, you're kind of bringing out that aspect of it. That, that interests me greatly. Okay, oh, I love it, thank you. And um, a little bit more of a technical question, and I believe this to be our last question. Is there a difference between a folk tale and a story? Hmm. Hmm. Um, I would say story is a generic term. I mean, you, you'll know yourself, Emmy, from your work with the Trust, that storytelling is a phrase that's used widely among digital storytelling, social media, um, news bulletins, everything. So story is a very generic term. And, and effectively, I think it means a narrative that compels us, um, a narrative that, that is human. Um, so it doesn't necessarily just mean a string of facts. Um, whereas a folktale is a very particular kind of story that comes from the land. There's folk tales from all over the world. Um, a folk tale is quite different to a fairy tale, which is often the kind of story that has kings and princesses and witches and rounds of three and sleeping and waking and, and death and life and all of those things. Um, so a folk tale might have a little bit of magic in it, but not really too much of the sparkly or dastardly kind. Um, there's a lot of folk tale about fairy, for example. I really wouldn't mess with them. Fairy tale, bigger thing, myth is a whole kind of pantheon to do with a culture. Um, and then creation stories, which are about how the world began. There's so many different kinds of stories and categories. 
And of course, you know, there, there are folklorists who've categorized them all neatly into all kinds of types. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, they, they do cross over, folk and fairy tale, they do cross over, but I'd say the folk tales are the, the more homely kind. That's wonderful. Brilliant, thank you for that. I've certainly learned something this evening and I've thoroughly enjoyed it. That was our last question. I'm, I saw, I'm sorry if um, we didn't get round to your question. We are running out of time slightly. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for this evening and thank you to all of you as well who have attended our lovely, quiet audience who um, one day hopefully we'll see face to face again. Um, just one couple of couple of last little bits. Um, if you've enjoyed this evening and you're keen to support our work, then um, there is the option of gifting Devon Wildlife Trust membership this Christmas if you're looking for the perfect Christmas gift or one of our beautiful 2021 calendars as well. We've got some of those in stock. They've got beavers and blue tits and I think some hairs in there as well to go back to the story. Um, and of course, there are Lisa's books as well. If you're looking for some folk tales over Christmas, then lovely Christmas gift. Um, all of those details are on our website and also on Lisa's website as well. So if you look up Lisa's name, Lisa Schneider, then you'll be able to, to see her work and what she does and where and hopefully catch her again for some more lovely stories. Um, lastly, um, we would love if you would keep an eye out for our final talk of the year, which will take place on Thursday, the 17th of December, same time, six or seven. And that's with our CEO, Harry. Um, and he'll be reflecting on this past year and looking forward to all of the opportunities, the, uh, the white hearts that 2021 will hopefully bring. So um, until then, thank you very much for joining us and stay safe, take care and good night. <laughs>